topic for tonight. We have two uh, coins as a topic, uh, three coins. It's Monero, Zcash, and Mimblewimble. And the question, how can uh, we make blockchain untraceable? This will be our topic tonight. And first of all, I would like to introduce to you our community, our, commu our Bitcoin meetup and our three formats that we have. First of all, we have a, a Stammtisch at the first Wednesday each uh, month. It's uh, down at uh, te uh, near Theresienwiese. It's called um, Wirtshaus am Bavaria Park. There we gather and we have, um, we sit together like good old German tradition. Hi. Just, sorry to mention it. We had just had a, had a later on, I have an information for you. Phil. Interesting, maybe. And at this meetup, yeah, we, we talk about Bitcoin. So everybody who is the first time here noted the first Wednesday in the month, um, come to our Stammtisch, which is a, a nice uh, event and where you can have questions and meet other people and other enthusiasts. We hear from newcomers that um, they are, um, they feel, feel comfortable there. So um, don't be shy, come over to the um, Stammtisch as well. The second event type is this event uh, that we have tonight. Um, we have it since two or three years. And yeah, this let me also um, thank, or my first thank goes to, to Michael um, for putting this event tonight again together. Give a warm welcome and thanks to Michael. This is really awesome. I come, I come to the Stammtisch and since 2012, and then first I, I met Michael. And what was come out of the Stammtisch is just amazing. Tonight we are here at TU München. Um, later on we will hear information about TU München from Atranik. Um, this is really awesome. And tonight we have, for sure, we have also, you know, the Bitcoin price tonight reached an all-time high. Um, we have um, two different things tonight. We have um, our topic um, of how to make blockchain untraceable. And we have another topic. Maybe you found it on your place where you sit. There's a small uh, paper a member of our community has written. And I start with this right now because it's really important for us. You see, um, Bitco, Bitcoin went uh, through uh, the so-called scaling debate for the last two years. And we as a community, we also have a stand here. And this information is written on this small paper. So you can, during the talks or during the small breaks between the talks, maybe you can find time, read it through. Um, uh, in the middle of um, November, there should be um, a hard fork, a planned hard fork. And we would like, in the end, we want, what, would like to know from you, small vote, um, are you for or against this 2x fork? Um, so you have time reading this. Maybe there are questions. We can answer or discuss questions later on. And we want to have this small vote. So with this vote, what, we, what do we want to do, do with this vote? We want to go to, afterwards, we want to go to Reddit and let the world know what uh, Bitcoin Munich is thinking. Because, as you know, Bitcoin, uh, this, this culture, this great culture of discussion and debate. Um, and it's important also that other meetups maybe follow um, our example and um, yeah, let, let the world know what, what the local community thinks. All right, so we have the topic tonight. Um, Juton, um, Zcash, Monero, Mimblewimble. Um, why is it important? First of all, question to your audience. Who of you has, has, has Bitcoin? Okay, everybody that, that raised his hands was, was clapping during the all-time high. Who of you, <laughs> maybe just an observation. Who of you has, has Monero? I see also a lot. And Zcash? Okay, great. So. I, I think you know why, why we address this topic. We address this topic because Bitcoin, nobody cares if you sign up, you can be pseudonymous. But 
No. But the thing is that after some time, if you make transactions, it's really, really hard to stay anonymous. So the really important thing is how, how can this be solved? And it can be solved through uh, new technologies coming up from Monero, can be solved through new technologies from Zcash. Uh, Monero has the so-called ring signatures and um, Zcash has the so-called zero knowledge proof. And we will learn tonight more about these technologies and how they help us to stay, um, to, to be not traceable during our transactions, which is an important thing. We also will hear information about Mimble Wimble, um, which is a new technology. I'm really cur curious to hear about that, uh, which um, maybe in the future um, is, uh, is for sure implemented in, in a, a new coin called um, Grin or in a, in a Bitcoin sidechain. All right, I just have a real quick look where we are. Um, I think I have, anytime you have questions, just let, let me know. After, uh, sure, okay, the timetable, that's important. We have, first of all, we have Andrani um, giving us information about TM Unique where I know that Team Munich is really, really engaged in the blockchain and crypto space, and Ranik is really active in the crypto scene here in Munich. Um, then after this, um, we have Paige, Paige Peterson, from Zcash. Um, she's community manager, and um, we will hear from her um, about the history of Zcash, and about, um, yeah, maybe also an outlook. I'm really curious to hear about more about the, 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 the it's um, for all of you who know Zcash is one year old and has this um, uh, funding ceremony where they have five or six people coming together and doing something which makes it really, really, really secure in the beginning. I'm curious to learn more about that. So um, after the page we have Justin. Justin is here, not yet here, but uh, he will come um, hopefully. <laughs> and looking for a parking space which is really hard here in, uh, in driving and um, uh, Justin um, gives us more information about uh, Monero and uh, yeah uh, the information about the technologies and yeah as I said then finally Mimble Wimble um, about this this new technology and we have then Q&A all right that's our timetable. That's the plan for tonight. If you have questions, let us know. Also, maybe um, after the talks, maybe two questions, and then for the Q&A. Okay. Yep. Okay, so I guess I'm all wired up now with two microphones because we have the live stream here. Um, first of all, welcome to uh, the Tech University of Munich. Um, who's here for the first time? Okay, lots of people, very good. So um, I guess you will like it and I hope so. Um, we are hosting this um, meetup today um, from the blockchain research group. So everything that you want to know about us, you can find on this website here, blockchain.tum.de. And maybe a little bit um, about us. Um, we are quite a large group right now. Oh, that's about me. <laughs> okay, let me see. Somehow it Okay, 
So you see the technology is a little bit outdated here. Okay, so this is our blockchain research group. We have lots of people. Um, we are now about um, 15 people, as you can see, some faces here. And the most important thing uh, that I wanted to show you is our activities. So what we do is we research the potential of blockchain technologies for different industries. So for example, uh, media industry, um, very broadly the sharing economy, um, also supply chain, finance, and so on and so on, insurance. Then we have a focus on organizational processes. So we look at how does blockchain influence or um, replace infrastructures for um, organizational structures, for example, um, financial transactions um, or marketing or even things like HRM. So we look at these things. And we also look at emerging competitive landscapes due to new technologies. So for example, we have mapped all the startups that are active in the blockchain space. Um, and you can also find our paper about that on our website. There we will find a huge um, overview of what kind of startups there are out there and also the valuation and where it comes from. Um, also, we do um, our own experiments. So here is a screenshot of um, the TUM blockchain, the TUM coin, where we are working on right now. And what we are doing with this is um, we look at how different parameters influence interactions on the blockchain. So for example, we look at um, what um, factors, for example, does anonymity play a role for how people interact. So you can see here in the second row, um, you can change the anonymity of the blockchain. And then uh, we look at how interactions work. So this is uh, one example where we could, for example, compare Zcash to some non-anonymous uh, setting um, in the lab. And this is the kind of research that we do. Here you see some transactions which are not anonymous anymore. Okay, so um, very briefly about our research group. If you have any um, interest in our work, please um, yeah, refer to our website. And um, I hand over to Paige, I guess. And once again, welcome and um, have a nice evening. having me here. It's uh, my first time in Munich and yeah I'm really excited. Um, by show of hands how many people were in Prague last, this past weekend? Okay cool so I'm gonna give a very similar presentation so I'm glad not many of you were uh, for, there for that. And I just got a call that um, my credit card detected abnormal spending because you know I'm in <laughs> I'm in, not in the States, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I put it on mute. Um, so yeah, my name is Paige Peterson. Um, I live in the United States and um, I do community and some communication and documentation work for the Zcash company who create the Zcash protocol. Um, I've been in this space for um, probably about four years now. I helped organize the San Francisco Bitcoin meetup for a couple of years. Um, that was really fun. Got to meet a lot of different um, Bitcoin related companies and individuals, um, especially, you know, being in San Francisco. A lot of people tend to go through that area. Um, so, and yeah, it's really exciting to work for Zcash because I have a, um, I'm really excited in um, you know the potential for cryptocurrencies to um, you know displace the outdated uh, systems that we have for money, and simultaneously, I'm a really big privacy advocate um, for just internet uh, privacy and security in general. So um, yeah, it kind of combines my two favorite uh, things to be enthusiastic about. So. 
So I'm going to talk about um, Zcash and what internet money means. So um, for to start it off, let's like kind of not think about cryptocurrencies. Let's just like consider what internet money might mean to you. Um, can you all see that? Do we need to like turn lights down or anything or are you good? Okay. Um, so not thinking about cryptocurrencies, something like it, money that's based on the internet. Like you want everyone to be able to use it. Um, so you need it to be secure. You don't want anyone's money to be stolen um, either like, you know, using the internet in the network side of things or the client side of things. Um, you want people to be able to protect their own money um, within their um, within their the, their own side of it and within the network itself. Um, you need it to be accessible. So anywhere that the internet is accessible, you want this it, this money to be accessible as well. Um, something that's not necessarily internet related, but money related is fungibility. So you need um, you need the money to be indistinct units of the money to be indistinguishable from other units in, of the money. So one unit of any currency should be equal to any other single unit of that currency um, for it to kind of maintain a stable value. You don't want to be able to say, I will accept this token, but not this token, even though they should be equal. Um, and you want it obviously to be private because no one wants their finances um, displayed for anyone to see or just like people that they don't want, they don't give permission to see. Um, so that's kind of where um, I want to start with this presentation. And then next I want to consider what Bitcoin and most other cryptocurrencies do um, and whether they um, fill all of the needs for this. Um, so Bitcoin is fundamentally secure. Um, it has a pretty strong network um, and pretty much wherever the internet is accessible, you can also use Bitcoin. So those two things it really has going for it. Um, there are a couple, the other side of things which are rather um, uh, related is the privacy and fungibility. So um, it, it's been historically thought that Bitcoin was private um, because uh, you know, people on Silk Road or whatever thought that they could get away with using it. Um, however, um, there are companies that are created specifically to analyze and, you know, research that's specifically you, done to analyze the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so as soon as you link an identity to any one address, you can kind of trace back in time and tr and watch forward in time any of the transactions that are happening. And if you can link multiple identities, then you can basically see the finances that are flowing between individuals on the network. And this is related to fungibility because um, if you can track a specific Bitcoin, then you can say, oh, this historically went through this person. Um, so I I'm not going to accept that Bitcoin, but I'll accept this Bitcoin because it's legitimate or um, whatever criteria you may have for um, for a legitimate uh, token in in Bitcoin. So those two things, um, at least uh, regarding cryptocurrencies, um, a lot of people in the space are, feel like are really uh, problematic. Um, and just this general idea of linkability is becoming a much greater concern, especially with the companies that are created just to analyze and sell the data that they are able to extract to various, um, uh, various organizations and groups. So if you have your identity linked to an address, then it might have already been sold to some some group that you might not want to know that you use that Bitcoin for. So, and a lot of the proposed answers um, 
historically in Bitcoin have been kind of layer two type things. So like taking a bunch of Bitcoins and mixing them together. Um, and there are some newer uh, proposals such as Mimblewimble, which we'll hear about later, um, um, which are really interesting. Um, however, there, there's some um, issues with how it's going to be implemented if it were to be implemented into Bitcoin. Um, so the, I guess the fundamental um, concept of Zcash is to have this privacy at a f like core layer. So it's a part of the fundamental protocol and um, there's no, uh, there's no distinguishing it from, there's no like layer two where you're trying to have privacy. If you, you can consider like, you can consider that it's rather easy to make something public once it, once it is already private, but it's a lot more difficult to make something private when it's already in this public network. So taking that concept and putting privacy in the core is what really Zcash is trying to do. So um, Zcash as internet money is basically what this is about. And we launched um, October 28th, which is uh, about one year ago. Um, so if maybe this meetup wants to do a Zcash uh, party or something, um, we're trying to uh, see if there's different communities around the world that, um, especially people that have Zcash and want to celebrate that um, we're one year strong, totally support that and let us know if, if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, so what Zcash really does is a enable the properties of blockchains and the properties of encryption to be combined. So you can consider attempting, for example, on Bitcoin, trying to encrypt some of the transact, like a transaction um, before it's stored on the blockchain. It's that becomes problematic because then the nodes in the network can't verify that that transaction is valid, that it hasn't been spent. Those tokens haven't been spent in the past and whatnot. So um, being able to encrypt transaction data on a blockchain is extremely difficult. Um, and that's what ZK Snarks, the technology that Zcash uses, allows for by generating a zero knowledge proof, which essentially proves that you have, um, you have access to the tokens that you're spending, that you haven't spent them in the past, um, and all, all doing that without actually revealing the data itself. Um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of cryptography and mathematics that go into it. Um, and there's a lot of resources online and more and more resources online. I'm not going into that here. Um, but essentially know that you're able with, uh, zero knowledge proofs in Zcash, you're able to encrypt the transaction data but still verify it. The nodes in the network are still able to verify that that, uh, that encrypted data is valid without reading it. And um, yeah. So the initial implementation thus far, um, we, we started with uh, an implementation that does both what we call shielded addresses and transparent addresses. So Zcash is a fork of Bitcoin with this zero knowledge technology um, baked in. So we decided at least at first to keep these transparent addresses within, um, within the network, which are essentially Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin addresses. Everything that's sent or received from those is uh, transparent on the blockchain. And then um, with the uh, shielded addresses, you're using the zero knowledge proofs to encrypt that side of the transaction. So um, can you see, I don't know if you can see the black text, that might be a little more difficult, but um, so essentially this is showing an arrow in that has a question mark for the amount of Zcash that's going in. Um, and also a question mark with the amount of Zcash that is going out and also a question mark for the amount of change um, 
And then the actual fee, the transaction fee is transparent. Um, so we always recommend that people use the standard transaction fee because if you were to use a unique transaction fee, people might, um, people analyzing Zcash m might be able to identify patterns or something. So we definitely recommend using the default fee. Um, and what is also another great benefit about these transparent, uh, sorry, about the shielded addresses is that we don't need to, like Bitcoin, um, generate a new address for each transaction for the change because the transactions between two shielded addresses are totally encrypted. You can just send the change right back to the original address and just keep using that. Um, for now, um, so the uh, this graphic right here is showing 10 Zcash going in, um, 8 Zcash going out, um, 1.999 Zcash as change, and 0 0.001 Zcash as the fee. So that's pretty much a basic Bitcoin transaction. Um, and then we also employ, I think we still have this, um, but we're intending to change it, which is Bitcoin, um, all the Bitcoin clients generate a new um, address for all of the change. We're considering just like getting rid of that and making the change go back to the original address anyway, um, which not as a way to like um, remove privacy for people, but just to kind of show that it's, it's a, it's, it's not the best, it's not a really good way to achieve privacy. So if you really want to use, have privacy, then you should just be using the shielded addresses. Um, so yeah, with these, uh, with these addresses, you can send and receive in between them. Um, and the privacy is specific to the address. So if you're sending from a shielded address, then that spend is, um, not recorded on the blockchain, but if you're sending to a transparent address, then the input is recorded on the blockchain. So you have to kind of consider um, how you're using Zcash, at least at this point. Um, the goal in the future is to get rid of transparent addresses. Um, so everything's encrypted. However, for now, um, there are some uh, really big benefits for having these transparent addresses, namely just third-party integration um, and the um, resource consumption that the shielded addresses use. So I guess quite a few of you have um, Zcash as you raised your hand. How many people actually use shielded addresses? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm assuming everyone else is just like, you know, holding on to it and speculating um, and that's, you know, that's, you know, it is what it is. That's fine. But um, that's one of the reasons why we chose to keep the transparent addresses in while we're improving the shielded address side of things so that it's easy for um, exchanges and just like cryptocur various cryptocurrency wallets just to straight up integrate Zcash because the transparent side is like essentially Bitcoin. So it's like very easy to add into your uh, Bitcoin wallet, um, where you're, where you have, where you support all these other cryptocurrencies. So that's our, our main reason for that. Um, and then I mentioned the resource consumption, um, right now, I might touch on it later, uh, in a bit in the presentation, but I'll mention the resource consumption for shielded addresses is, um, pretty bad. Um, you know, because you used it before, um, it's uh, it's about three gigs of RAM for 40 seconds. So you're not doing a shielded transaction on your mobile phone, that's for sure. Um, but in the future, um, we and we have all of this documented in our blog and whatnot, but so right now uh, the, the version of Zcash is called Sprout. The next generation of Zcash will be called Sapling. It will require a hard fork. However, um, it will improve the shielded uh, resource consumption drastically. Like the, so it's three gigs of RAM right now uh, for 40 seconds. It will be, um, our benchmarks show us 40 megabytes for about seven seconds. Um, 
I don't know. Are we doing questions? Should we wait? Okay, go ahead. I'm, I'm just uh, curious about the governance. Oh, the, the governance of the company? Oh, yeah. Um, let, I'll talk about that later. But, um, yeah, that's a good question, though. Um, so, yeah, so obviously if you, um, I, I suggest people that want to try doing a shielded transaction and have a laptop that they want to do it on, um, install one of the various clients that uh, support it. Um, there's clients for Linux, Windows, and Mac that all support the shielded transactions. Um, but again, not for Android or iOS yet. Um, so, yeah, this is what I was talking about. Great. Um, so right now we basically have four, uh, four exchanges and wallet um, providers. We have this level one and level two integration, which level one is just like Bitcoin, the Bitcoin shielded uh, transparent addresses. And level two is the working with the zero knowledge proofs and the shielded addresses. Um, and then this uh, ZK snark resource constraints, again, improving. We don't have like a specific date for this. Um, we, we're just saying 2018. Um, sometime, a roadmap hopefully will soon come out um, for when we intend to do that. But we're doing a lot of the research right now. Um, and I should mention that the Zcash company has um, who we call the seven scientists. Um, they're the original creators of the zero cash and zero coin papers and protocols. Um, and maybe I should mention that. Um, so the history of the history of this zero knowledge proof in cryptocurrencies started with um, zero coin. Um, and this paper came out in like 2013. I believe it was presented first at the San Jose uh, Bitcoin conference and um, you know all those scientists went to the Bitcoin core and were like hey look we resolved all the privacy problems with Bitcoin why don't you add this in and they were like well it's kind of inefficient so and we were like managing a really big economy right now so we're not gonna we're not gonna think about that yet um, and then the that migrated with better improvements on the efficiency into zero cash um, by a similar, uh, some of the same scientists, but um, some additional scientists as well. And then Zcash is an implementation of zero cash um, with some additional improvements. Um, but yes, all of these scientists that have been researching zero knowledge proofs in blockchains are basically advisors for us. Um, so they're doing all the research to make it um, zero knowledge proof in Zcash even better. Um, yeah, and that graphic shows exactly, exactly what I was referring to. Um, so I want to talk about the improvements of more people using shielded addresses in Zcash. Um, so right now you can probably assume that this is kind of what the network looks like so there's a bunch of transparent addresses happening if you were to analyze the zcash blockchain which we hope um, some researchers actually do and tell us you know and tell our users um, what how how much is actually being shielded at this point like and how much um, people are actually using the shielded side of things but we're assuming it's pretty low, um, and you can assume you can kind of think of an anonymity set as a pool that um, you can't distinguish any one unit in that pool from each other. So, the larger the anonymity set, the more privacy you have. So, for example, if everyone in this room were wearing a mask, and like someone, like um, I don't know won a game or something, or I don't know, we wanted to identify one of you, it would be much more difficult to identify one of you versus um, like a group of three of us wearing uh, masks, for example. So the larger the set, the larger the privacy guarantees. So we want to go um, 
especially with the snark improvements go in that direction where the pool is much larger and um, privacy for everyone is better guaranteed. Um, I also want to mention that um, if you do want to play around with shielded addresses, you actually benefit more from just um, using a shielded address kind of as a, a proxy. So even if you want to set use Zcash on your phone still, you can um, have your clients on your laptop, which supports the shielded addresses, and send from that client to your mobile wallet. And then the history of that transaction, of, that, uh, of those coins is completely broken. Um, there's a few considerations that you want to have, but generally the fact that other people are using shielded addresses and that you might use a shielded address before you send to a transparent address is a much greater improvement on the privacy than um, if you were to just use transparent addresses all the time. So, um, yeah. Um, so what, so internet money is, um, it, like as a general concept, it should be used by everyone from like individuals to enterprise. Um, and we've seen a lot of instances within this first year of Zcash um, for why people will, why people from individuals to businesses want to use, want to have privacy when they're using a blockchain um, or just with money in general. So there's actually, um, there's this uh, foundation, nonprofit called Courage Foundation and they accept, they currently accept donations for um, a variety of truth tellers, uh, you might say, um, basically for legal, uh, legal funds for um, people that were, have been put in jail for various reasons that others may or may not agree with the, those reasons for. So in particular, there was this one uh, journalist that shared a link um, that, uh, about a private company that essentially landed him in jail and then there was this legal fund that was being raised and the FBI uh, decided that they would subpoena the um, the payment processor that they were using to collect the donations in order to identify the individuals that were donating to this person or donating to their legal fund. And as a result, the Courage Foundation decided that they wanted to you at least provide the option for supporters of Barrett Brown and um, they also support Edward Snowden and um, historically Chelsea Manning and a few others, um, their, their legal defense, um, just giving people the option to donate privately. Um, so they added that to all of their, their um, beneficiaries. Um, similarly, WikiLeaks also found it beneficial to add Zcash um, after uh, having Bitcoin and Litecoin support for a few years. And similarly, we're seeing reports um, from people in Venezuela that are interested are in using Zcash. And I mean, they're interested in using cryptocurrencies in general because their, uh, their currency is hyper inflated. You might have heard last week that one Venezuelan Bolivar has um, reached parity with one Satoshi, um, which equals to about 20 to, or sorry, 2000% inflation in, you know, a number of years. So, um, you know, regardless of what you think of fiat money in general, like this situation can happen. And this is just the present situation that is happening right now. This historically has happened to other countries as well. So we're seeing individuals, um, in these countries who are, have, an oppressive regime that are trying to find a way out so that they can securely store value. So they're not just like spending all their money on, on you know, food immediately, just so that the, the, their savings doesn't keep crashing. They're looking into different methods and relatedly the Venezuelan government does not want them to be doing this. So um, some people are looking into Zcash as a means of um, the privacy, providing better privacy for that 
Um, and then, you know, from those kind of individual um, use cases, um, you can also, you know, just generally consider private use cases. Um, like you don't want your anyone to know that you're like what uh, finance what your finances are. And similarly with businesses, they don't want their competitors. They don't want um, their yeah their competitors to learn about uh, their supply chain, um, where their funds, where their revenue is coming from, and how much they're spending. So it's privacy is extremely important for for businesses and. Um, large and similarly with large transactions with banks banks are um, interested in blockchains as we all might be aware but they're definitely not interested in the transparent side of things um, and the public aspects of things they want all they want to be able to secure their their uh, transaction data um, just so that they can see it and and no one else and um, something that is um, really useful with um, the property of encryption. Um, so you might have in the past just like encrypted a PDF before and it was just, you know, you encrypted it and it was a password to access it. Um, that's a pretty basic tool that a lot of people use, especially when you're sending documents over email or something. Um, so you can use that same property within Zcash um, for added utility of the uh, of the money of the blockchain so you can say here's this key this password or key um, so only you know this individual or this group of people can have access to this transaction but not the entire world so that's just like a basic fundamental thing that's re very useful when you're considering um, the benefits of Zcash and other uh, other cryptocurrencies that are private um so yeah um actually i kind of want to talk to this question now about like governance and hard forks because um we're not like explicitly sure the mechanism that we're doing we're talking about it a lot um but you know actually Shout out to Monero. They do hard forks like every six months or something, and their community's just used to it. Like all of the mi all of the miners and the nodes, they're um, they've just gotten used to this process. So um, you know, it's not impossible. Like if the if the hard fork is beneficial for everyone, like you know, if you're improving the zero knowledge proof so that you can use it on your um, your phones, then well, how is that? It's not really controversial, so it's rather easy for people to get behind, and it's um, been done before in other cryptocurrencies. It's only really a big do deal with Bitcoin because everyone's making it into a big deal. So, yeah, so we're not really worried about hard forks, um, and um, kind of, I guess, extending on the governance idea. So, Zcash is currently run by um, or developed by the Zcash company. Um, you might consider that there might be a conflict of interest as a for-profit company running this. Um, we do simultaneously have a Zcash foundation, which is, um, you know, we support each other, especially in these early days, but the people on the board of the Zcash foundation are not anyone that work for the Zcash company. So those are separate, and the idea is to move the kind of infrastructure development over to the foundation side of things. Um, one thing that's really beneficial about having a company kind of uh, start Zcash is the bootstrapping thing. We are able to get uh, investors um, before we launch so that we could pay developers and keep it a healthy, uh, healthy improvements on the system. So, yeah, um, I think that's one thing that kind of differentiates us from a lot of uh, a lot of other projects in the space or cryptocurrencies in the space. And um, some people that prefer Monero, for example, prefer it because it's more community uh, minded and community focused in terms of development. Um, and Zcash just kind of has this more. Um, we, we, we're using this company mindset in order to 
kind of like help get things off the ground and you know it's a lot easier to do business development it's a lot easier to do reach out to exchanges and wallets and you know pay people to do all these things so um i think that's why we've seen a pretty healthy growth over the past year is because we um, are able to sustain these projects um, and not to say that we don't have any community related aspects to Zcash. There's a really large user community and developer community. Um, Zcash only supports the like the Linux Debian client. So any other Zcash wallet you use was made or is supported by some other group of people. Um, so there's clearly an incentive for a, for our community to create these different projects based off of uh, the infrastructure. And we don't need to, and we can then focus on the infrastructure itself and making it better, et cetera. Um, and I guess it was mentioned um, in the intro, interest in learning about this, this ceremony thing, but so I'll briefly mention it. Um, there's a lot of cool stories actually online. Um, if you've ever heard of this Radio Lab podcast, it's a uh, NPR, which is a na the National Public Radio in the U.S. Um, they did a really cool piece on on the ceremony, uh, so I recommend checking that out. But essentially, in order to use zero knowledge proofs in an efficient way. Um, there needs to be a shared set of parameters that um, is generated in a certain way. And you can kind of think of these parameters as a public key. So everyone sees them, everyone uses them to create the zero knowledge uh, proofs in Zcash. However, in order for any system that has a public key um, with an associated private key, the public key is always derived from the private key. But with this, this system, the private key is actually what we call toxic waste. So if any single person had, had the full private key, they would be able to uh, inflate the Zcash currency and counterfeit and basically you know, mint as many Zcash as they wanted. So we did this really elaborate process, which we called the ceremony, um, but it involved um, different stations of people that generated just a shard of the public key and the private key. And then, um, uh, so the idea was, yeah, there's, there's so many interesting elements that go into it. Um, I just recommend you looking into it, but essentially each station had their own shard of the public key and private key and they destroyed the private key aspect. So, um, where the pub public key was shards were all brought together and then that's what is used as the parameters in Zcash. Um, and it's such that if any one station in that ceremony was able to successfully destroy their private key shard, then the entire ceremony is safe and the parameters are safe. So. Um, we're fairly confident. We've had audits on, on this, uh, especially one of the stations was done, was hosted by a uh, security audit company and they basically analyzed their whole station and afterwards and like, yeah, did a, a security analysis of um, if there was any potential attack on their node or anything like that and they didn't, um, they came to the conclusion that there probably was no, um, um, there's probably no uh, issue with someone accessing their shard of the private key. So if you believe that one um, auditor, then you know that the rest is safe. If you believe uh, that Peter Todd destroyed his shard of the private key, then you believe that the ceremony is safe, um, et cetera. So definitely recommend uh, looking more into it, but it is a really cool um, cryptographic thing that's never really been happening never really uh, happened before, so um, it makes for a really good story. Um, and yeah, so we've had a lot of growth in the past year, and we have a lot of things that we're planning on doing. Um, I don't know how much time I have left, I'm sorry. How much? 
I could keep talking, but <laughs> so, okay. I'll just talk about a couple other things, um, that are really cool upcoming. Um, so we have, we did recently did the fir our first, um, test of how our implementation of a atomic swap between Zcash and Bitcoin. Um, so that's kind of in an early experimental phase. Um, we're intending on kind of fleshing that out and making that more usable. Uh, but that essentially means a decentralized exchange between two cryptocurrencies. You don't need to trust a centralized exchange. So relatedly, we're also working on this concept called um, payment disclosure, um, which basically means that you can, um, when you're generating a proof, for a shielded transaction, you're generating, it's making the, the key that if you were to give it to a third party to view that transaction that no one else can view, um, it's making that whole process a lot easier and efficient. So, you know, if you're, you know, even just like basic concept, if you're doing um, taxes and you don't want to use, you don't want to have all of your transactions, um, you don't want, to, the you know you don't want to give the tax authorities your pri your private key to spend but you want to give them some private key to view the transaction um, that's a very basic uh, concept that we're making we're working to make more efficient um, and then kind of as a supplementary to the future improvements of zero knowledge proofs in zcash we are working on this thing called payment offloading which would allow um, to offload that heavy computation to a server side. Um, so for example, Trezor and Ledger um, and KeepKey all support Zcash, but they only support transparent addresses because they're just like little things and they don't have memory um, to do the shielded transactions with. But with payment offloading, then uh, it's, it's over anyway, it's okay. Actually, no, I had one more slide <laughs> that I wanted to end with. Um, so if you were able to offload that computation to like the Ledger or um, Trezor servers, then, um, or a personal server, then you could um, make shielded transactions on a Trezor or all of these little hardware wallets. Okay, and then to end it, I just wanted to do some Bitcoin trolling. Um, so, <laughs> can you read that? It's a little cut off, but it says, uh, Bitcoin, Twitter for your debit card, all your spending sent to that creepy ex-boyfriend, your business competitors, and everyone. And that's, that's it. And like, these are all of the um, ways you can reach us. Um, obviously, the code's open source. Um, and we have a great community. I forgot to list it there, um, but it's accessible through the Zcash website. So if you want to join our online community, whether it's the forum or the online chat, um, we regularly maintain communication with the community. We do most of our development process and communication within the community chat room. It's a very open development process. So if you're interested in that, you can stop in and ask questions and everything. So thank you. We're waiting for after? Um, we can have questions right now. Oh, OK. Two OK, two questions. Go ahead, because you use shielded addresses, so you get it. OK. OK. First of all, Darian is doing this upgrade called Xanthony. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And they plan to reintegrate ZK Snarks. Yeah. Yeah, they've already tested it. Yes. What do you think will be the major difference in between Zcash? Because um, they want to do it vice versa. Zcash wants to implement um, smart contracts as well. Yeah, I mean, we're not super. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the the age old question of why Zcash if Ethereum is implementing zero knowledge proofs, um, and also vice versa. Um, so. Um, Zcash is 
not super like i guess we're like relatively interested in the in the smart contracts thing but i think we're more interested in the sense that bitcoin has smart contracts like you can do smart contract things in bitcoin um but um ethereum implementing zero knowledge proofs um they they have such a wide focus that this is just one small piece of their of their platform and we're always we have the scientists and our thought is that we're always going to be like kind of on the bleeding edge and able to research these better improvements. Um, I mean, not to call to, uh, not to appeal to authority, but Vitalik has also kind of said that Zcash is probably always gonna be one step ahead with all of this stuff because they focus on so many other things, like they're like a world computer or whatever. So that's, oh, um, and, uh, so yeah, there's that, and um, yeah, so we're not super focused on like doing Ethereum style smart contracts. We're a UTXO uh, blockchain, so we're not gonna be doing Ethereum level things in foreseeable future. We wanna make things, we wanna make the privacy like super, we wanna be internet money, like that's what we're focused on, okay, yeah. So you think the major difference will be in like, uh, you will focus on privacy? Yeah. Our, Ethereum is going to focus on yeah, yeah, and yeah. And um, I can ask a second question because it's very similar. Sure. And um, like, I think you know the project, which is Tezos. Yeah. Um, they made a huge ICO, and um, your boss is an advisor. Yeah, CEO. Zico. Um, I think he received like 20,000 bucks for Tezos. Okay, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and um, they want to implement or they plan to 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 um, do set case knocks like zero zero knowledge proof without the trusted. Yeah. So everyone says that they want to do. Um, so he was asking about Tezos and saying that they want to do zero knowledge proof without this trusted setup in the ceremony that I was talking about, and that is um, uh, a thing called Starks. Um, Starks. Yeah. Everyone wants to do that. We want to do it. Um, but it's not efficient. So Starks actually came before ZK Snarks. Starks was the uh, like an original research project um, by the similar scientists, and ZK Snarks came after as a way to actually do it in an like a implemented production um, system. So it's just impossible to do right now in blockchains. Um, so yes, when Starks becomes efficient enough for um, people to use in blockchains, then it's going to be erased to Starks. But in the case, like, uh, when Tezos will, or if, if Tezos will introduce, like, um, the set case knowledge of Starks without the trusted setup, um, what do you think will be the point of set cash? Um, so, I apologize. I don't really know too much about, um, Tezos. Okay. So, I can't really speak to that question. Um, yeah. No problem. Um, go ahead. Um, you say that you want to become internet money, um, but um, from what I understood, you're a, hot, a fork of Bitcoin, which means your supply is, like, is limited to 21 million too. Yep. Um, so um, do you see that with Bitcoin mined 60 million that people tend to not spend it because its value is increases all the time, but for money it should be transacted. Right, so you, what's your take on that? Sure. Um, so uh, they were asking about the uh, tendency for people to hold on to onto Bitcoin and how, how is Zcash going to be different from that if we're a fork of Bitcoin? Yes, we have 21 million uh, tokens. Um, I don't, I don't know, like, I assume people are going to continue to speculate on cryptocurrencies that don't have a, a cap, um, or that, sorry, that do have a cap, um, and I think, personally, I think that's better for the health of the, of the system, um, to have a, a cap for how many tokens are going to exist. Um, maybe there's an argument for a regulated, um, ever-increasing inflation such as ethereum um uh i over time obviously we're going to reach that 21 million and we're going to become closer to it um 
and maybe with the more blockchains that are coming into existence, um, you're kind of getting that inflation anyway. So I don't really have uh, an answer to that one either, I guess. Um, I think that's just a more market uh, speculating on how the market uses things. Um, but yeah, sorry. Maybe I'll think about it more and talk to you after. <laughs> uh, I think I can't, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know, but is it possible to revoke the anonymity of the person who is making the transaction? Technically, I don't know if it's supported here in this technology. If it's possible to revoke the privacy of an address, um, to, yeah, from someone else doing it, or you personally as the owner? Because if you are the owner of an address, then you could potentially reveal the key that would allow other people to view it. Um, for a third party, it would, I mean, it would require a similar level of like brute forcing any private key. So it's pretty secure, I guess. I think I'll, I'll talk to you after, I guess. I mean, okay, thanks. <laughs> This is for the live stream. Oh, okay. So. <coughs> organizational uh, announcement. The building will close at 9 p.m. here in the front. So if you want to leave after 9 p.m., then you would need to go in this direction and then leave the building through the main entrance. So it's still open. We're not locking you up. But you cannot enter, uh, exit from here from this side. You need to go here in this direction, then on the left-hand side, and then you can enter, uh, exit through the main entrance, okay? I forget the web address, so I just have to go to this. Or are you ready? Yeah, sure. about the technology that makes it untraceable. Now we have here Justin Smith from Monero. He's working for Monero. Justin started five years ago with a project. He had a startup. He had an e-commerce startup. He wanted to accept a Bitcoin as a payment solution. And that led him into the crypto space. So without further delay, and Justin, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we'll just we'll just leave it. Uh, do we, is it possible to expand this to full screen? F11. Oh, that one didn't do it. Oh, there we go. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've been into Bitcoin for some time now, and uh, if you've seen the price today, then that's one of the reasons. You, you know why. There's a lot of sort of continuous excitement in the cryptocurrency world. Um, and one of the other interesting things about cryptocurrency is the people that, that are involved in it and the drama that plays out. So there have been a number of, of stories that have happened over the years that, uh, that I, I feel I've been pretty close to, actually. It's, it's one thing to read people's posts in a forum, and then another when you realize that you're seeing that person on the news for one reason or another. 
So <clears throat> um, the fascinating thing is, is that we all get something uh, out of it for ourselves too. We all get a little story out of it and, uh, and, and we all learn something. And I think, I think that's what, what makes this really interesting is, uh, is the anecdotes that we have. So I have two anecdotes that I'll, I'll share with you that maybe help to explain how I got into, into cryptocurrency or into Bitcoin in the first place. So some years ago, and this was many years ago, there was uh, a product that came out that banks released and it's called online banking. And at the time, it was really nice because this is really convenient. You no longer have to get in your car and drive to the bank to do your, your banking business. Instead, you just opened up your web browser, you entered your username and password, and then you could, you could do everything you needed right there. So your job or your employer would pay your wages directly to a number somewhere. You just gave them this number. And then everything that you did in life then revolved around that web browser and then two little plastic rectangles your credit and your debit card. And there was an option to withdraw physical cash from ATMs, but that cost money. So you were disincentivized to take out cash. So I behaved in a, in a way that I think most other people behaved in that I just ended up using credit cards and debit cards for everything. I thought that physical cash was dirty and prehistoric. Uh, I mean, this, this sort of metal slug and, and piece of cotton in my, in my pocket these things are hundreds of years old, and, uh, and this is not modern. This is not you know, innovative technology. We need, to be, we need to be moving ahead into the digital future. So I'm also uh, the type of person that uh, I, I like to call it a, a Kanban system, but I, I use it in my life. So that means that I never have any food on hand. And uh, so I needed, I needed to eat one day, and I didn't have any food in my cabinets. So I went to the grocery store, and when I went to pay, uh, to my surprise, my credit card didn't work. And then my debit card didn't work. And then I realized that I had a little problem. So I had no cash, and so I had to leave the store uh, hungry as I entered it, but then now annoyed that, uh, that, that now there was, there was another problem to fix in my life. So I called the person. Uh, at the bank, and uh, and I said, what what's going on? Why aren't my cards working? And he said, oh, it's it's because we froze your accounts. He said, uh, we're not sure that we have your current residential address. <laughs> I said, well, that that's weird. I gave you my my post address. You know, I'm moving pretty pretty frequently now, so that's where I get all of my business mail, and you're my business partner. And he said, well, we have to know your residential address. I said, that's weird. I don't ask any of my business partners or people I work with where they sleep. I said, why do you need to know where I sleep? And he said, it's because it's the law. And I, I realized that um, this was, there, there was something more going on here than, than I originally imagined. And, uh, <clears throat> and after that, I, I got a pretty funny feeling, you know, because I didn't really have any option at this point. I, I had somebody's boot on my neck. If I wanted to eat, I had to give this guy my address. I had to tell him where I was sleeping. And, and, and so when I connected those dots, that was, that was a, a strange realization. So after that, I, uh, I started using cash a lot more. And uh, I closed that bank account. And it doesn't even operate in the United States anyway now. Um, but the realization that I had was that financial sovereignty is something that's really important. And uh, really, it's, it's a tool. So essentially, we use money today to coerce people into doing what we want them to do. And, uh, and I, I realized it at that time. And, and that's how people use money. They use it as a weapon. And so when I started using Bitcoin, and, uh, and I started to really enjoy Bitcoin, the, the understanding that I always had with Bitcoin is that it is the perfect tool for financial sovereignty. And so I still believe that today, and I think it will continue in the future. And I really think that Bitcoin is, uh, and this is one of the reasons that Bitcoin will be 
it is better money and it will be the backbone of the future financial system. But there was, uh, there was another little incident that happened. And uh, that was when I was flying back to Chicago through Miami one time. And, uh, and I was selected for special screening. And the, uh, the, the, the person put on their white gloves, their latex gloves, and they very carefully, he very carefully went through my bag. He's, he was looking for something, and I don't know what, but uh, I think he was, he was annoyed that he didn't find what he wanted. And so he went over to a computer, and he started typing some things in. And then he looked at me and he said, what were you doing in Bangkok last year? And then what were you doing in, in Kuala Lumpur just after that? You know, what, what kind of things were you doing there? <laughs> and I, I thought, but that's, that's strange, you know. I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that my flight records are available to, uh, to certain people. But it's strange to have them wielded in, in this way, in this circumstance. You know, I knew that he was trying to get something out of me. And that, that also gives you a funny feeling. So, um, you know, I, I told him and he, he let me go without incident. You know, it was, it was mutual contempt at that point. So he didn't get what he wanted and, and you know, I was disgruntled. So <clears throat> what I realized though was that um, privacy is really important too. And the privacy of your data is super important. And it's not just that one anecdote that you know, describes why privacy is important. It's, it's important for a ton of reasons, which we don't have time to talk about. But essentially, this was also an idea that crept into my mind. So when I work with cryptocurrency, and when I, when I really was working with Bitcoin uh, a long time ago, what I was always looking for, and I think what a number of other people were looking for, was a way to really make Bitcoin private. And so, we knew that privacy was really important for cryptocurrency. We knew that privacy is really important for money. Uh, privacy is important for people, period. And money is, uh, strangely enough, considered a type of speech. And, uh, and we need to be able to, to speak freely to each other, depending on the context. So for several years, I, I looked for a solution, and a number of other people did too. And we looked and looked and looked, and there were a number of, of uh, proposals that came and went. So there were some, some proposals that would augment Bitcoin in some way, and none of those really panned out. Uh, they weren't feasible. And then there were some proposals where you would fork Bitcoin. Uh, there was dark coin and there was black coin. And these things also were not feasible. These things also came and went. And today we have a number of other things that have sort of popped up that claim to be privacy coins. So people understand that privacy is important, but in reality, and from what I've seen, there's really only, there's really only two alternatives to Bitcoin. And one of those alternatives is Zcash. Uh, and then the other alternative is Monero. And, uh, <laughs> and of course I've, I've picked Monero for a number of reasons. But, uh, but one of those reasons is that in Monero, privacy is not optional. So defaults are really important. If you're into software and you understand software design, you know that the defaults that you give your user are most likely going to stick. So in most cases, your user is just going to go with what you've given them. So what we need to give our users is privacy by default. That's really important. So financial sovereignty has to be a default, and then privacy has to be a default. <clears throat> so let's switch gears a little bit. I've been working with banks <laughs> and, and financial service companies now for a little while uh, in Switzerland, and I've learned some things. And one of the things that I've learned is that, uh, you know, I think most of us, with we, when we have just normal bank accounts, we feel pretty vulnerable, you know. Uh, other people can really see, and we don't really know who those people are, but they can see everything that we do with our money. But the reality is that uh, if you're a certain type of person and you have a certain amount of money, uh, you can actually have pretty good privacy with your finances. And, 
And really, what I'm saying is privacy is on offer. So there are a handful of people around the planet that have really, really good financial privacy, really good financial privacy, but it costs. It costs a lot of money. So that's, that's one kind of aspect of banking today. And then the other aspect of banking is that banks have kind of an adversarial relationship with their clients. So banks, of course, are just after making profits, but uh, they want to have all of your money on hand and they want additional profits. So they want your money and then they want you to pay them uh, for everything else. So <clears throat> one interesting thing, though, about, uh, about this privacy that banks offer is that uh, even though it's really good, even though it's really effective, and you can generally trust your, your private banker, especially if you're very wealthy, sometimes it's not really up to your private banker whether or not your data stays private. So there have been a number of very high profile data breaches in Switzerland over the last few years, uh, and even in Panama. And, uh, and, and so people's, people's data was revealed, uh, it was exposed. And really, it wasn't, it wasn't the fault of the institutions that held that data, right? It was, it was either coerced out of them or it was stolen from them. Um, so actually, the organization itself, its, its intentions were in the best interest of its customer or its client. But the, uh, the problem here ultimately is that no matter what type of bank you are or what type of financial institution you are, you're still a third party, a trusted third party. And um, as a famous person once said, trusted third parties are security loopholes. So uh, that's really a problem. Uh, when you have to trust a human to do the job that a machine should be doing, uh, you're going to have more failures. So I think that we have uh, a few new machines that, uh, that can replace those trusted third parties. So what does is, what is banking tomorrow look like? What does the bank of the future look like? So I, I don't have really a pessimistic view of, of banks. Uh, rather, I think that um, today the bank is more of a, uh, of a cost on society. I think it's more of a tax on, product, on the productive economy. And I think that in the future, that, uh, that's going to invert. So I think that banks uh, will become part of the productive economy. They'll have to offer really value-added services. Um, and so what are some of those things? So you know, one of the things that I think banks will start to do is they'll start to audit the code of your software. Uh, most people are not able to evaluate the software that they're using. They can't really tell whether or not there are any loopholes in it. And, uh, and in fact, few people can. And I mean, that's the reason for open source software anyway, is essentially you have so many uh, dependencies and so many files and so much code in a lot of these software applications, you're not really going to find all of the bugs right away. You need a lot of help. So if you have a professional institution whose only job is to go through and evaluate the likelihood that there's a backdoor or a loophole in the, in the wallet software that you're using, that's pretty nice. I think that's worth paying for. Um, and so I also think that banks will provide backups and restoration services. So uh, as many of you might know, how many people have, uh, have, have a fully validating Bitcoin node running right now? How many people have own their own money? Yeah, nice. That's great. So. Um, I think that uh, you guys understand that uh, you know, there's, there's a problem with being fully responsible for your own money. It's that, uh, it's that you're your own enemy. So you need to protect yourself against yourself. And I think that, uh, that banks can help provide solutions where they don't hold your money, but rather they help you provide a restoration or backup to your money. So, uh, in case you become incapacitated or you're not able to make decisions for yourself, um, they will help you make arrangements so that, uh, so that people that you actually do trust, multiple parties can come together at once to, uh, to help you recover your money. I think they'll also train you for security. So it's really important to have good digital hygiene and good online hygiene. And, uh, and what that means is that, uh, you know, you, you really need somebody pestering you saying, hey, 
you know, you're going to get phishing emails. And if you click on them, you could lose a lot of money. And, uh, and I think the bank might play that role. And then one of the other big issues that we have today is ownership. So in, uh, in meat space, in, in the fleshy world that we live in here and that we talk in now, um, we kind of have a loose understanding of ownership. You know, do I own this laptop? Uh, I don't know. Do I own this laptop? Well, I, don't, I also don't know. The, the linkage between the human and the object is, uh, is something that we all kind of have to agree on. And I think because there's some, some difficulty in doing that, you really need a, uh, a trusted third party that specializes in that. So when I buy a house from you, I want to make sure that you actually own the house first. And I might enlist the bank to help me ensure that, that you actually own the house that you claim to be selling. And then lastly, and, and probably most importantly, is that I think banks will recommend that clients use Monero and not Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, I, think, I think there's one really, really good reason for it. So why not Bitcoin? So uh, I grew up not too far from Chicago, and Chicago has a, a pretty good history, I think. And, uh, and in Chicago's recent past, the advice was that if you're walking down the street, uh, you just want to keep looking ahead where you're walking. And if you hear gunshots and screams over here, just keep walking and just get to your destination. Uh, you don't want to become aware of what's going on around you. Because if you become aware of what's going on around you, then you could be called to testify as to what you witnessed. And if you're called to testify as to what you witnessed, you might never make it to the witness stand. You might end up at the bottom of the Chicago River uh, because, yeah, that testimony is not going to benefit some people. And I think the same exact thing is true with financial institutions and with corporations that are handling payments today. So the reality today is that most companies and banks are doing the work of what intelligence services used to do. And that's a cost that's imposed upon them. And it's a cost that's imposed upon them because it can be. It's because it's too easy to know this information. It's too easy to collect it. There is no cost to collecting it. It's cheap. It's fast. And so that burden is placed on these companies. And they don't like it. The banks actually do not like their compliance situation because it costs them money. That's their biggest cost. How do we manage this compliance thing? So I think that's why not Bitcoin. So why Monero? Well, I think on a very high level, I like to think of Monero as cash in the mail. So I was, I mean, I was not, it was not too long ago for me that the internet didn't really exist. So I kind of grew up with the internet. And there was a time when the internet first started where you really couldn't figure out how to buy things from people on it. So it connected you to other people that offered things. You wanted something, and someone else somewhere had it. Uh, but how did you pay them? And that, that was the problem. And we ended up just sort of you know, using credit cards. It's really the worst thing that you could ever use. But really what you wanted to do was you wanted to put physical notes in an envelope, and you wanted to mail it to the person. But there are some problems with that method. So one is the malicious mailman. The person could, along the way, someone could just take the cash out of the envelope, and nobody would ever know. The recipient would actually never get the cash, you'd never get your goods, and nobody had any evidence of anything that happened, right? This is an anonymous currency. Uh, however, now we have something that's really interesting. I think Monero is a really interesting technology because it is an, as anonymous as cash, However, you can prove that you sent it. So there is no problem uh, with, uh, with the malicious actor intercepting it along the way. And um, yeah, I mean, of course, it gets there instantly. You're not putting it on a, on a horse, and the horse runs across the country to deliver it. Uh, so there's no chance of it getting lost. You know that it's going to get there. Uh, 
It's backed by a lot of computational power. If you send the money via Monero, the person gets it almost immediately. And that's it. And then I think there's one other interesting aspect to Monero that uh, is worth noting, and that's that you can actually restore it. So with the, with the euros in your pocket, if, uh, if I drop some of these on the ground, or this is, this is a five franc coin, but if, if I drop it uh, and I walk away, you know, it's gone. <laughs> and it, most likely nobody's going to give it back to me, chase me down and give it back to me. But <clears throat> with Monero, all you need to do is have a little code written down on a piece of paper somewhere. So even though your money is actually stored on your phone, with my phone, I use my phone as a prop, but even though your money is actually stored on your phone, literally on your phone, that's where your money is. If you lose the phone in the river or in the lake, uh, your money is not gone. You just simply restore it from that, that piece of paper. So that's quite valuable. So then the other thing is everybody wants to know when, when does this happen? When does this amazing future start to happen? When can I use internet money? <laughs> when does it go? When does it moon? When, when, when? So the, my answer is that it's happening now. So in Switzerland, the Swiss railway has, uh, has ticket machines placed all over the country and, uh, and they're within walking distance in every village. So pretty much everyone in Switzerland has very easy access to these machines. And through these machines, you can buy a number of digital goods, including Bitcoin. So all you need is a wallet on your phone, uh, a digital wallet on your phone, and some physical notes. And you walk up to this machine, you give it your phone number, it sends you a pin code, and then you put the notes in and it gives you the Bitcoin. So that's pretty seamless, that's pretty nice. In fact, that's the very first thing that I do when I come back to Switzerland from any EU country is I put my euros in there. I get rid of the euros right away. I don't want the euros. <laughs> So, so uh, anyway, uh, because Bitcoin for me is more valuable, you know, I can more easily buy a VPS, I can more easily uh, register a domain name, uh, I, I can do all kinds of things, you know, I, I have more than one foot in the digital world, so uh, it's, very, it's very convenient for me to have Bitcoin. Uh, so, anyway, the... The, the key or the centerpiece to this entire new world, actually, is your mobile device. So the, the important piece of this puzzle is actually how do you get the, the money that's in your pocket now, today, onto your mobile device? Like, how, how does it get in there? Uh, that's, a, that's a real challenge that people have. They get excited about Bitcoin, they download a wallet, and they say, okay, well, what now? How do, I, how do I get the money into the computer? And so this is a way to get the money into the computer. And you need, to have, uh, you need to have a mobile device in order to do that. You need to have a mobile platform in order to do that. And you need to have something that's, uh, that's private as well. So I don't really want people going around just using Bitcoin with these machines. And the reason is that you have to put in your phone number when you buy Bitcoin with these machines. So you're using an anonymous currency, the Swiss franc, right? It's minted on the citizen's behalf by the government. And the government has been authorized to do so, right? And they print this physical cash and they give it to the people to use with their authority. And that's true of every government in the world. So all the governments in the world are printing this totally anonymous cash. And then what's happening now, though, is my passport is actually connected to my Swiss phone number. So it's very tightly controlled. So uh, I'm giving this system my phone number. So now it knows my passport. It knows exactly who I am, it knows my phone number, it knows my location, it knows everything about me. And now I'm taking my totally anonymous Swiss franc and I'm putting it into a system, which is Bitcoin, which is fully transparent, fully traceable. So now every single transaction I make with that Bitcoin I just bought is now linked to my identity and it's tracked throughout the entire system. So it's basically salted and tainted so that people can watch exactly where that money goes. And they track it all the way through. And it happens all day, every day today. If you use an exchange, a Bitcoin exchange, or, or any other method where you've given out your name or your address or your IP address or anything, 
it's been linked to you. And uh, in fact, Coinbase, which is one of the most popular brokers, uh, they've been known for shutting down people's accounts. They'll track the Bitcoin three hops away. And if that Bitcoin ends up at a gambling site or another website that they don't like, then they just terminate that original person's account, the person where it originated from. So that's pretty dangerous. And, uh, and so now I'm, I'm actually a little hesitant to tell people to go buy Bitcoin uh, in this way. I, I'm not as excited as I was five years ago, let's say. So I'm more excited actually to tell people about Monero because I think Monero really protects people's privacy as well as their digital sovereignty. And the key to this is, uh, is we need a mobile wallet for Monero. And it's actually kind of a difficult challenge because of the way Monero works. Um, so I started up a company earlier this year uh, after a friend told me about Monero. He said, hey, check it out. There's this, there's this, there's this digital currency. It started as a, as a scam. And, uh, but now, but some white hat people took it over, some smart people took it over. It was made by smart people. And then some other smart people had a coup. And, and there's this interesting thing, so check it out. And I did. And so uh, the, I really love Monero now. You know, I, I've only been interested in it for most of this year. But the key missing element was this mobile wallet and this mobile experience. So my idea or my concept is that I think that people would like to use private Swiss banking if they had access to it. I think most people in this room would like to have a numbered Swiss bank account with a private Swiss banker that they could call and talk to. I think that's pretty cool. That's a nice service that people uh, in general would like. And that's really what you can have with Monero. So I see Monero as the new Swiss banking. So I see it as democratizing private Swiss banking, where in the past, or even today, only a handful of really, really wealthy people around the world have access to these services. I think Monero democratizes that service, and I think it delivers it to everybody in this room, and I think it delivers it to everybody in, well, most, of, most developed countries. I mean, it's over a billion people that have iPhones. So that's who, that's who I'm uh, targeting with this, uh, with this app and with this service. And, uh, and that's how I see the, the future playing out, is that uh, is Swiss banks were before only able to reach a small number of people, a small number of people that had to come to them. But now they can reach out to over a billion people. So that's, uh, that's, that's my, my take on Monero. Thank you guys for listening. Take a few questions? Yeah, take two sure. questions. Sure. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I, I, think, I think the question is how do, you, how do you sort of speculate on the price of the asset without, without holding it? Is that? Not, all, no, not, not exactly. Uh, how can I uh, 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 try to be part of a, uh, a, a anonymous system or having my, 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 my assets uh, in that system that Monero created for me and then going back to uh -huh. Bitcoin or even cash, uh, and uh, keeping my my uh, discretion and, and uh, sure. Identity. Yeah. Okay. So how how do you transition between Bitcoin and Monero and Monero and Zcash? I, I think that's that's really the. Yeah, fiat is, that's a different beast. <laughs> fiat, fiat currency, I, I think, is gone and dead. I, I, think, I think fiat currency will be used by some people, but it won't be me. 
and it won't be the people that I do business with either. Um, you know, I think the, the future is already set with, with Bitcoin. Um, I, I think that's already done. And then I think we'll use these other, other assets for very specific purposes, like to get the benefits of private Swiss banking, for example. This is def definitely not like a retail payment solution, right? Like you're not going to use Monero to go buy a stick of gum at the store uh, unless gum is illegal or something like that. I, I don't know. But, uh, it's, but that would be a we really weird retail payments use case, right? Like I can't imagine anyone doing that. But to transition between, transition between these assets, what you have to do is a thing called a cross-chain atomic swap. And so the Zcash team is actually experimenting with this technique. I think Decred is also experimenting with this. And essentially, and Litecoin and Bitcoin, of course, you can already do cross-chain atomic swaps. But the idea is that this, this is a completely peer-to-peer -peer exchange. But what you have to have is you have to have a fully validating node for both currencies, for both assets that you're going to be exchanging. So you need to be running a full node for Bitcoin. You need to be running a full node for Monero if you want to do those cross-chain atomic swaps. If you want to add a third one in there and Zcash, you need to have a full Zcash node as well with the full blockchain. So you'll have a lot of storage requirements. Yes? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you can always reveal your balance. You can always sign uh, sign with your with your public key, you know, just like in Bitcoin. So if you if you want to prove for some reason that you own a certain amount, you can do that. You can also reveal your transactions uh, with your private key, so you can prove uh, mathematically that you actually did pay someone, or that you, for example, that you actually did pay your taxes with it. That would also be a use case for the private spin key, or private view key, rather. Other questions? Yes? I have a question about the tax thing. Sure. If it's all private, then how, how, do people, how do countries ensure that you're paying you know, an appropriate tax rate? Yeah. So how, I guess my question back to you is, how do they do it today with physical cash that they provide? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert in that, right? Like, I've, I've worked under the table for you know, a few years. <laughs> Yeah, you'll for sure be audited this year since this is live streamed. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, basically the the people. Oh, okay. <laughs> Still, even worse. So, so I I think I think the the answer though is that um, is is that people sort of, of course, it's a very cultural thing too, and, and it's a very national thing, and so you know. I think it's Americans number one and Germans number two or vice versa in terms of how, how fervent we are with paying our taxes and making sure that gets taken care of. And then it, I think as you get down into Venezuela or Argentina or something, it's something different. But I mean, this is a different culture. This is a totally different story. This is not for us to decide. This is for people to decide locally how they handle these things. But I mean, I know that, that basically I'm being watched and the endpoints are being watched. So the people I do business with, I mean, these things are all trackable and traceable. And so, you know, if you're supposed to pay taxes, then you just pay your taxes. Because if somebody does come knocking on your door, they, they'll audit you and, and they will compel you to, you know, this, they'll look at your books. Cash business has been done for a really long time. I mean, the reason Al Cap my, going back to my Chicago example, the reason Al Capone went to jail was, was, for, was for tax reasons, right? But all of his stuff, he's arguably one of the best, you know, money launderers, criminals, or whatever you could ever imagine. Yes? So if you're, if you're moving between Bitcoin and Monero, for example, through a cross-chain atomic swap, how is just moving from, say, Bitcoin to a fresh Litecoin address back to a fresh Bitcoin address not? So the, the question is, what's the difference between a cross-chain atomic swap and? Through Monero versus through Litecoin or Zcash or anything. Okay. Even a non-private, non-anonymous. 
Sure, sure. So to one Sure, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's the, the, the technicals of it are, are pretty complex. But on the, on the surface of it, what we're actually saying is that I have, I have some assets here uh, of type A, and I have some assets of type B. You have some assets of type A, and you have some type assets of type, uh, type A and type B assets. And then really what we want to do is we just want to safely exchange those between the two of us. And that means with cross-chain atomic swaps that no third parties are involved. So we just need to discover each other. And I need to discover that you want to sell a certain amount of asset A. And I, I, want, to, I want to buy a certain amount of asset A. And then, let's say there's not even two parties. Let's say there's one party. Sure. Like me and me, right? Sure. I know that, let's say, my BTC are tracked and painted and probably linked to me. If I fire up a full Litecoin node, yeah. generate a new address, yeah. put some Bitcoin into that, but you can't, pull that back out through to new Bitcoin address. So you can't send, you can't send transactions across yes. chains. Yeah, so you, you actually, so these are incompatible protocols, basically. So atom atomic swaps mean that you're involving a couple other techniques. So you're involving a pay to script hash and you're involving a time lock. So essentially the, the atomic swap is you, you are actually trading with another human. Uh, yeah, I mean, if like essentially once you're using an asset of a certain type of protocol, it will always be traceable on that protocol. So if you're using Bitcoin and the Bitcoin network, it's always traceable through there. If you're using Litecoin on the Lightning network, it's always traceable through there. And I mean, just because you send yourself a transaction doesn't, doesn't mean that now it's private or that it's been unlinked. I, it maybe doesn't. Even once it jumps chains. It, so it, that's the only way to jump chains is through a cross-chain atomic swap. Yeah. Yes. Just, yes. Excuse me. I just want to be fair, and uh, we have um, after this we have um, question and answer, so uh, uh, we can go on. Ah, uh, sure. Um, thank you so much, Justin, yeah. for the information for uh, about Monero and privacy. Yeah. Like, like I said, we have um, we have one more one more short talk, and then we have Q and A and all the questions. When you think now that we as a Bitcoin meetup invite you for uh, this, uh, this event here, you have just the answer, no, don't use Bitcoin because Bitcoin is traceable uh, and this makes no sense. This is not a good answer. So um, the, the answer comes now, and I'm really curious. The answer is called Mimble Bimble. We have Ccash and Monero already great names, but Mimble Bimble sounds already more fancy than that, and the technology behind this is also really fancy. Without further delay, now I give over to Mike. Thanks. Okay, just a short introduction to Wimble Wimble. Uh, we wanted to get a more high-profile speaker for this topic, so, but, but flu season and all that, so you have to deal with me now. But I'm really just want basically sh uh, sh uh, mention shortly that. Uh, the Bitcoin, uh, in, in the Bitcoin development space, there's also um, something going on because it was, of course, always the idea to have an anonymous kind of digital cash and crypto cash. Uh, if Satoshi would have known how to do it, he would have done it, but it was just not known how to do it back then. So um, from a while back, I think, I think one or two years ago, in the Bitcoin development channel, it, uh, which is called, which runs on IRC, the channel is called Bitcoin Wizards. Someone came up with a pseudonym out of Harry Potter and proposed this strange paper um, that was linked in, in, into the dark web. So really, really, he did it with style, yeah, and also anonymous, like Satoshi. Um, and he proposed this paper and, and uh, after the develop other developers um, saw it was safe, um, safe enough, and, and opened it, um, uh, they they actually peer reviewed it and and found it it, it it's safe and it's a good idea, um, and and this is this became basically the roadmap for what the Bitcoin developers 
um, are focusing on for the plans of privacy and fungibility in the future for Bitcoin development. Um, because of course, um, for various, reason, various reasons, it, it's, it's of course um, 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 difficult to make changes to the Bitcoin protocol. So it was first proposed to make these changes as a so-called side chain. That means you have basically two blockchains, uh, um, data, data structures for Bitcoin. You can swap your coins between the two. Uh, um, state them and, and, and they can run in parallel. So it's m almost like an altcoin, but it has the security, the hash power of Bitcoin actually. Um, what Mimblewimble actually does is um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solution unlike Monero and Zcash, which, which is also potentially much more scalable. It actually scales better than Bitcoin itself in the long term because um, the way it works is you have Today you have basically um, inputs and outputs for transactions, and and you sign uh, you, uh, you you sign the input with with your private key. It's it's like you you apply cryptography in general. Today you have a private key. Um, for from there you the, the the public key is calculated. Um, the, this is this is how in most use cases um, elliptic curve cryptography is applied nowadays. Um, there are, of course, more fancy way to apply um, um, this, this cryptography, but uh, the, what the Mimblewimble developers came up with is really some kind of unique way, and, and it, it really goes deep into the, the cryptography. Um, it's, it's a bit like multi-signatures. You, uh, uh, you, uh, you, you can have more parties to, to uh, sign a transaction, right? Um, uh, but this goes even further. You can have a private, um, uh, you, you can transact with, with, with multiple parties. Uh, you know you have a, your private key and you don't have to actually know the public keys of, your, um, of the parties you transact with. You only need to know um, some kind of sum of all public keys and you can still prove that, you, uh, that your private key was still in this transaction somehow. And uh, that's basically the magic behind this Mimblewimble thing. It's really magic. Um, and, 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 and so what you can do then is, if, um, basically you can, you can view every, well, every, block, every block of transaction as a, as a single transaction then. And you can, you can throw away a, 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 lot of, a lot of data eventually. And this is basically, what, what makes it scalable then? It's not, it's not a solution that, that has a higher transaction throughput. That's not the case in this case. This would still require a Lightning Network. But um, it's actually a blockchain that would not grow with time. It, it, it grows with usage because you can, you can always throw away things. And you also don't have to archive things. The, it, it doesn't even make sense in, in a Mimblewimble blockchain to, to have an, to, to have to, to archive old data because this old data is meaningless. All public keys of transactions can be discarded. They don't have any, any informational value. So this is what makes it especially private and also more scalable. And, and one argument of course is that well, as, J as Jason said, um, it's not privacy by default right now, but maybe if it becomes a sidechain one day, maybe the other sidechain where Mimblewimble is applied will win out in the long term. Who knows? So uh, that's basically the gist of it. So um, just to have this mentioned, thank you. <laughs> So we have the information now complete. We have Monero, we have Zcash, and we have Mimblewimble. What's left is, give me one second, I have to change the mic. What's left are three things. We have, uh, we have two books left from last time. We had a guest here, um, Aaron Koenig a book author and writer of crypto coins, a book for uh, investing in cryptocurrencies. Uh, we want to raffle them off real quick. 
we have Q and A later on for sure, and we have our votes for uh, the upcoming fork, and we want to listen to you as the community. So let's start off. As as last time, I have uh, prepared questions. Um, so. Um, if you know the answer, raise your hand, and the first one giving the correct answer will get a book from Aaron Koenig called CryptoCoins. So um, I prepared, um, as last time, a number of questions. I just have a look because, as I heard, uh, we have a really experienced audience tonight, so I will pick one of the tougher questions. Um, yeah, and, and oh, okay, sure, for sure. And so, so we have this, this uh, little paradox. The books is for beginners, but the questions are tough. So however, <laughs> whatever you want to make out of it. But it's Bitcoin related questions and the book is for investing in other currencies. Take it like this. So the experts in Bitcoin learn how to invest in cu other currencies like Steam or uh, Dash. All right, so my question is, we heard about the, the beginning ceremony one year ago. That reminded me of um, the 3rd of January 2009. There, Satoshi Nakamoto released the so-called Genesis block. Within the Genesis block, there was a message hidden. This message related to a headline from a newspaper. Which newspaper? That was this guy in the fifth row. Congratulations to you. I will bring you the book. The answer was the Times. The Times. This is the newspaper that uh, the headline referred to. And the headline was Chancellor in Brink of something uh, financial crisis. But he, he know, knew the answer. What what was this, the the headline? I think it was about something about the head of the Federal Reserve and that after the banking crisis of 2008. Exactly. Second Thanks. Bell the Second bellow for the banks. Thank you. All right. So, thank you for the answer. Great. Um, last time I had, <coughs> but it was a little boring. We had this this hashing question already. So let's see what we have. Uh, another information that came then to my mind, which I thought was really interesting, is at this day, the first block came into existence. But when did the second block came into existence? Can you, can you say a time frame? This is no time frame. Say something like one second, ten second. Uh, I don't know. Okay, that's not that's not a so great precise answer. But thanks. Do we now any any anybody? Time is ten minutes later. Yeah, I thought that would I, I will, will hear, but it's not ten minutes. And it's really curious. It's really fun. Okay, I, I you get the book because it's six days. This is really interesting. So it's six days, and after this, it's nearly 10 minutes. Congratulations on this one. Great. All right, so we have the books, we have the raffle. Now to our. Do you have an explanation? No. <laughs> My research was just this information, and uh, I thought it's, it's a funny question, but by, uh, uh, yeah, curious. Let's talk about. On the, on the next stuntish or whatever, and somebody finds out. Um, but now I we. Think, but I think you must calculate the first block separately from the common algorithm for, for mining. Because you must, in the mining, you must find the longest end of the blockchain. And if you have no blockchain, you must create the one. That, that would be the first. But maybe his mining algorithm is wrong. No, it makes us curious. No? And the first block has no last one. That's why you must mine the first block separately with a separate algorithm. And then you publish them for, to the network. If, if he's the only one mining, 
there's no point mining more than that one block. So he sends it to his friends to help build this project. So That's also an them. idea. Yeah. And so said, see if you can mine it. So yeah. Rather than himself mining, pre-mining okay. Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Interesting answers. Interesting guesses. Okay. Thanks.